Hi guys, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Kornay Bester. Um, I'm currently working for a, a startup that's based in Germany, but I'm working from beautiful Cape Town today. Um, and today it's not a technical demo, so um, I'll go jump over just maybe a short introduction to myself. Um, and then I'm actually going to talk about some of my experiences uh, over the last 10 years that I've been working in cloud. Um, and Hopefully it's not deaf, deaf by slides. Um, I do have a quick show in the end, just about some structure, how we do our Terraform today. Uh, but otherwise this is mostly slides and I'll talk uh, through them. And then also in the end, I've got an option for like Q and A if there are. Um, right, so just a little bit of background about my journey. I've been working in, in IT uh, for more than 20 years. Uh, started off in telecommunications, uh, but around the financial services space, uh, doing basically high low latency um, stock market information to brokers and banks. And then over the years, basically organically grow. I even started before the internet was a thing. So technology evolved, computing evolved. So I kept sort of organic growth in my career and keep up with infrastructure but always been very uh, close to the hardware, the servers and the networking switches. And also this why this talk is around Terraform and sort of my passion for networking and connecting things. Um, I'll go in later to some of my sort of the later companies. After 13 years in telecoms and financial services, I basically moved to two startups. Um, and most of the talk will be, sorry, after the two startups, also I worked for a small medium enterprise. Uh, that was moving their on-prem stuff to the cloud and rebuilding that sort of for more modern era. So that's roughly my background. Uh, the talk is not going to be a tech deep dive. I'm not going to show code or Terraform. Um, this is uh, purely around my experiences with like in the evolution of infrastructure as code over the last 10 years and also multi-cloud and across different industries. Uh, then also just added that uh, no uh, some working knowledge of Terraform would be useful, but it's not essential. Um, and also like cloud vendors like Azure, AWS, GCP, uh, just some of the terms I refer to. Right, so roughly about 10 years ago, I joined a small medium enterprise after my initial telecoms career. And we were um, busy in the analytics space after uh, financial services trades happen, like on stock markets. And the company were hosting a lot of these services as a SaaS solution on premise. And it was difficult to scale. It always had problems. There was computer problems. And then the cloud also became uh, sort of more prominent. People were starting to adopt it. And our business made a decision. They want to rebuild our on prem SaaS location um, services. Sorry for the cloud. Um, and we started, I was based in Cape Town at the time still. Uh, a team in Cape Town actually started to experiment with Amazon back at the time. Um, I, at that stage, had a lot of networking and operational knowledge, and I actually got involved with the team starting to experiment on Amazon. And a lot of this back then was, the, I'm talking 2013 roughly here, uh, was still very infrastructure as code was not a big thing, even though CloudFormation was available. It was still JSON-based. Uh, I basically got my intro into cloud there. I start playing with things like anyone else, do some click in the UI and you provision infrastructure and actually see the beauty of being able to provision stuff on demand, just delete it. Um, also from a business side, it looked like cloud will solve all the problems. It's like there's like limitless uh, capacity. It's on demand. You can take advantage of cost. You don't need to have all these upfront costs. Then another thing what it was came into play, and that's because we were in financial services, there's regulatory compliance. So we had to be, uh, because we work with financial services um, and specifically trade information. And it was also, uh, I have to add here, this company was based in the UK with offices in South Africa. Uh, in the UK, they head office and also big data centers in North America, uh, in Canada. So we had three on-prem data centers, um and we had different services and products deployed on-prem and we wanted to take and rebuild this for cloud but the business was also very like uh afraid with like technology can you be secure in the cloud can you tick all these isoo and socks compliance re uh, requirements 
So that was something where I also get involved with my background and like stuff I've done on premise. Um, and I'll continue into sort of that, that space. That's also where I got involved in cloud first because I have this uh, history with making things sort of compliant uh, to match regulatory stuff. My also, and this is where my cloud journey sort of started. Um, they didn't have like landing zone concepts that we're familiar with today. This is something relatively new, say that's been around the last four years. So back then it was still a lot of manual work. I started off like anyone else with uh, was some people jokingly called infrastructures click where you just click on the UI, you provision VNets or VPCs, you create security groups, internet gateways. Um, so a very manual way of doing things. Um, I also, um, because I started working with multiple teams, the team in Cape Town started with Amazon, but we had a product uh, development team in the UK that also wanted to break into the cloud, but they were all Microsoft stack and they wanted to go to Azure. So I started working actually on both these clouds, helping these teams with connecting cloud resources to on-prem databases. Still a lot of manual work, doing things in the UI, not completely understanding how cloud works yet, because on-prem was all manual. Yes, there was some automation, but it's still in the cloud, everything is foreign. I also started with cloud formation templates to start at, because because of all these manual work, uh, try to look at some automation um, and get a feeling for, for cloud formation. It was quite painful because it was all JSON based back then. Azure had a completely different approach. You had to use ARM templates, which is basically uh, PowerShell scripts. Um, and they also don't have a state concept so you would provision stuff stuff need to change you'll have to delete them again it, you can't add or modify them so there was quite a bunch of limitations with both arm and cloud formation then also another challenge was uh, because we multi-cloud um, we had needed to have multiple accounts for development and production resources uh, multiple environment for like production dev test and it's cross cloud and we've got on-premise, it's like these tools just doesn't scale. It doesn't help to have a different tool for every cloud and every product. And that's where Terraform sort of came in. Um, I first got like, because I struggled with, not struggled with cloud formation, but because it, you didn't have a unified place where you can manage all your compliance requirements and security rules. Um, Terraform was like very cool for me back in the day and was like also like now you have a single tool and you can work on both Amazon and uh, Azure and possibly on-prem. VMware, because I was, we were big on VMware as well, they started adding providers. Um, so we, I got involved with building landing zones before landing zones was a thing today. Um, basically doing these standard account setups. Uh, we were doing things like cloud trail and config. Uh, across multiple Amazon accounts, uh, doing observability integration, central lock integration. So we, I think uh, at the time we had like five different Azure accounts, nine different Amazon accounts on-prem, but we had a central lock uh, ingestion solution and we wanted to aggregate all the locks in the company in a single place. So we're doing a lot of these landing zone standard tooling or shared tooling uh, also hybrid networking with VPNs and uh, interconnects between cloud and on-prem because we moved quite a lot of data around. And then also the requirement came for, again, compliance and regulatory to have Active Directory, it's basically single sign-on access across all these resources. So yeah, Terraform basically empowered us to start automating a lot of these things because we cookie cut the, uh, the recipe across these accounts, even across cloud. Um, and so it, um, you basically it solve a lot of uh, regulatory um, and like uh, checks. And when you get audited, you can say you've got all these things in place uh, in the financial services industry. Um, so very, very good, like start of my career, evaluated the different tools, ended up with Terraform. Um, just, yeah, so that sort of wraps up the first, I spent seven years with this uh, small medium enterprise, but only the last four or five of them were, uh, around sort of cloud and scaling cloud, making things standard, was not so much involved with the software engineering or development process at the time, even though I worked with teams and we tried to get standards going uh, because we also had development teams in Italy, in the UK, in South Africa, and they all worked on different stacks. Um, so I worked as like a consultant and my team, we grown a lot later to like a three-man team. 
um, we became sort of this uh, first DevOps team in the company that um, provide these landing zones for all the teams, and then they can build additional services on top of this. Then I actually got the opportunity to join a startup. Uh, and I've never worked in startup because my first start, part of my career was corporate and then I worked small, medium enterprise. Um, and I loved cloud just because my career organically took me to a place where you can now provision infrastructure as code. Um, and um, I thought, yeah, this would be fun. So I joined, actually, I left the financial services industry completely and I joined a public safety uh, startup that was based in the US. Uh, but also a development center, and it actually originated in South Africa. Uh, that's also why I sort of call my main topic a tale of three continents, because my experience span like these three continents, North America, Africa, and Europe, uh, even though our customers is global. So what was interesting when I joined this startup is they were post a Series A funding, so kind of already in a, they've had a market fit and they were ready to scale to sort of the next big thing. They had large clients in the US already signed up, um, but also because they're in public safety, um, that is like 911 systems in the US, so when people phone for emergencies. So the startup was basically using modern mapping technology like uh, Uber and though basically to find people. So very high availability systems needed to be required, very high transactional system because there's obviously a lot of calls happening in the day. Um, and because it's government clients, so public safety is part of like the government portfolio in America, they also have like quite strict regulatory compliance around um, where data lives, it's not allowed to leave the US. Uh, there's also, um, what was interesting is Azure had at the time, I think AWS as well, they've got what they call sovereign clouds. So you've got a public cloud, which anyone can use, and then sovereign clouds, you need to prove you work with government clients. Um, another interesting, when I joined the startup, is they're very performance and latency sensitive. Um, it's like, uh, because it's in a 911 space, if someone phone and they got a heart attack, um, seconds matter, um, and you can't wait like five minutes for something to process uh, in telephony systems. In because the startup built basically a platform to find people and then dispatch the correct um, response to that. So latency performance is very in, uh, a big requirement from the business. And then they needed to scale to multiple regions um, and public and sovereign clouds because they've actually had customers in both these. Um, so one of the, the big requirements here was also to get uh, infrastructure as close as possible to the end users. For example, the state of California and the whole state was a big customer, but the closest Azure data center was actually in Arizona in the US. So these things started matter when you've got like millisecond latency uh, requirements, you need to co-locate sort of your resources uh, close to your customers. But then we also started getting more customers in other states. We had Kansas and um, South Carolina, North Carolina. So we actually had to break into multiple uh, states in the US. So we started hosting in Virginia, we had in Arizona and um, there was also server data sovereignty limitations. So like this Arizona state, for example, don't allow the data to be leave, uh, to leave actually outside the state. So for example, if there wasn't a Azure data center in uh, uh, um, Arizona, you couldn't host there. You'll have to have some other solution. So luckily some states are less uh, strict on this. Other states are more. So it's very similar to like, data is not allowed to leave the European Union and move to the US and vice versa. So Terraform again helped us here basically scale. So we've created like this large um, template uh, declaration of all of our resources and some each region have roughly about 70 different ones. And that being app services for those that work with Arizona with event hubs, AKS clusters, um, storage. So Terraform allowed us basically to scale and break into new states by using this cookie cutter approach. Uh, we've got this defined template of all the resources we need, and we can just basically pick this region, parameterize it, add some customizations depending on the size and the requirement of the state, 
and provision it as closely as possible to, to the customers. We had also some other cases around security testing because we're in government, sorry. Um, we needed to do some testing and also for performance, um, so quality testing, uh, QA, and also for performance testing to make sure the pro product's performance is. And this is where Terraform is also useful to basically create resources. We can set up basically a complete stack, do some testing, tear it down, and you don't have to have something running all the time. Um, still on this uh, startup I joined, it's in North America. So you mentioned about Terraform that came to the rescue. Uh, we managed, and this is just, I'm going slightly more into how we use Terraform. We stored actually our state in storage accounts back then, uh, which is a Azure um, type of S3 service combined with EFS. Um, we had multiple service repos. So we had actually like, uh, a definition for all our app services and we had a definition of all our storage. So we separated basically by service, um, not by product per se. And we also later started using some Terraform cloud, but in a very early phase. Um, then I'll get back to some of the details a bit later on, on, on like sort of structuring uh, repos and Terraform code because that's also a very opinionated thing and it differs from company to company. So I'll just share some of my experiences a bit later. Um, first off, we started with Azure, basically every Terraform resources in Azure were as Terraformed. We later added Datadog monitors because we had to repeat a lot of things. And that's obviously one of the things Terraform solves is you have got repeatability for your infrastructure and you also got this complete definition and you can actually version your infrastructure what it should look like. Uh, we added lock ingestion resources later that was like central to the company and even Cloudflare, we started terraforming. Um, so roughly, I think four different vendors uh, terraformed at the time, um, but also in various phases. Sometimes, and I'll speak later a bit as well, it doesn't make sense to terraform something if there's just a few changes necessary. But if you have to repeat the same config across 20 different regions and different customers, it becomes a sort of a requirement. Um, roughly as well, so we didn't use workspaces back then. Uh, we used basically Terraform VARS files for those that's familiar with it. Uh, and basically have a, a single template of what our um, infrastructure looks like. And then we any differences we defined in a Terraform VARS file, be it the region, be it government cloud. Um, just also sharing a bit here, what was interesting is that we ran into problems where the sovereign cloud, the government one in the US, actually was lagging, the APIs was lagging the public cloud. So you do basically development on the public cloud and by the time you wanna release a new infrastructure, say version two of an API gateway, it's not available in GAF and you need to, basically wait five to six months for this feature to be uh, available. So just something to be aware of. Sometimes there's quite a, and even you see this in Amazon today, it's become less over the last couple of years where they'll launch new services first in say Virginia and the US in a couple of weeks or even months later, you'll see it ro roll out to other regions. Um, some regions is faster than others, but there's always like a delay when, when new stuff is released. <laughs> Right then, um, just moving on to um, keeping note of the time, we moved to another startup. One of the big reasons why I left was um, I was missing Amazon. Amazon was sort of my first love. I started my cloud journey with Amazon uh, and I prefer Amazon above Azure, even though both clouds got their strength. So I got the opportunity to join another industry and another um, startup, which was actually in the logistics space. So first off, obviously, my career started in financial services, then I were public safety and now logistics and also apply using Terraform uh, knowledge and tooling across all these because they, they're not really tied to industry. You can solve the same problems. Um, just a little bit about the startup. They post Series B funding, so slightly more mature than the other one uh, of where they are in, in their business. Um, and we also have this, uh, what we call streamlined teams is a, basically you build it, you run it approach and also share nothing. So this is a very new sort of modern paradigm, uh, of building software, um, and moving fast. So I joined there, um, a cloud, uh, platform team as a cloud team lead, 
And we basically now today provide a developer platform uh, to the enablement of our development teams. So we even take Terraform and abstract it further um, and Kubernetes, where we, instead of my previous startup, I was more customer focused or the tooling we do for our customer. I've also switched slightly to provide more internal services today um, to we still have our development teams, which is our customers, but also our external customers using our marketplace, because that's what we have in the logistics industry. Um, so we have this requirement that we basically have to manage um, or allow developers to create testing environments on demand, to test features, to move fast. So today, just a quick recap, we've got three EKS clusters in multiple Amazon accounts. Uh, we've got three production-like environments and then 20 plus test environments. So our product teams use these test environments to, uh, to deploy versions of the code to test a new feature. And if they done, they basically, it can be promoted to, to production. So we're trying, we're not sharing test environments. Each team has got a unique environment and they're also responsible for the data and data migrations, everything around this. So we do a lot of empowering developers to move fast. So our estate has grown quite. We've got more than 120 RDS, Aurora MySQL databases. Uh, we've got Amazon message queue clusters, lots of S3 buckets. So all our policies um, in IAM is used by Terraform. So um, quite, quite a next evolution of how we roll out and manage everything with Terraform. Um, just moving on as well, just because of the time. Also Terraform. So when I started, there was some Terraform. Um, I built up a team of five people now today and quite a, a bunch of smart engineers. And they also like come from different industries, very DevOps background. So we actually taking Terraform to a whole new level. We're also using Terraform Cloud now completely. So all our state uh, is stored in Terraform Cloud, not S3 buckets anymore. Uh, we use Terraform Cloud workspaces. So we separate our environments uh, by Terraform workspaces. And we also started to do like continuous deployment in some of these VR workflows, which I'll also talk about. Um, just around the vendors we manage with Terraform today. So we even do um, of zero, we add a Confluent Cloud to Terraform. We use Cloudflare, Snowflake. So we use Terraform basically to provide this um, integration and development platforms all with, with Terraform today. Couple it strongly with Terraform Cloud. Um, the workflows, we also integrated with um, GitLab. So we use GitLab. We use pre-commit hooks uh, to basically validate Terraform code. We look for security vulnerabilities. Um, it triggers an automatic um, pipeline in GitLab that actually does CI integration. So it checks, the, validate the plan again. It runs a Terraform cloud plan, provides you with a list of changes. If it passes without any errors, you get a green tick in GitLab. Uh, and then we still have a gated apply. So we still need to uh, verify the plan before we actually um, apply the infrastructure changes today. Um, just uh, be very conscious of time. What's left, we're shifting even more left. So we're providing the self-service where teams can modify our infrastructure as code repos, and they can provision their own elastic registries, uh, their own service accounts, their own S3 buckets. Uh, we provide some standardized modules of S3 and what RDS instances look like, and they can provision this on the fly. Then just a couple, I'm going to run through some tips and tricks over the last couple of years, uh, learned. Uh, and uh, first one, should you automate this? And the question is, Sometimes the effort, there's a nice infographic I could share, but I just didn't have the time for the slide. I would always ask the question, do, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Do you want to scale something? There's so many providers today, you can terraform every single thing. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense to spend an hour or two to write the infrastructure code. If it's something that's only going to be done once uh, and forgotten, so or forgotten. So I would always ask myself, my default is to terraform all the things, but you should always ask you as well, is the effort you're going to put into it worth it um, versus some other problems you can solve? Um, then another tip, read your plans properly. So when Terraform gives you a plan, always read uh, the plan very carefully. 
especially if there's a destroy and a recreating plan. Uh, we've been burned a couple of times where you scan too quickly through a plan and then actually you lose data or something um, yeah, unexpected happens. Then treat your infrastructure as code tooling, just, just as you would other software. Keep your provider binary um, and your providers up to date. There's every month there's a couple of new releases. Keep an eye out for upstream vendor API changes. And then also stay abreast with updates and gotchas. Uh, we subscribe to like GitHub provider repos with alerts if there's security updates or breaking changes. Just a good practice as well. Uh, then adapt to your dev team's business, like looking back across all the three companies where my cloud journey has been, they each had different requirements. The one was around regulatory compliance and being able to be all past certifications and audits. The other one was around performance and being close to customers. Again, also about where your data lives, these things. And then the latest startup I'm working at is about give, making development teams move faster. So you got to adapt to your development teams and your business where the requirement is. And your Terraform code will sort of follow that pattern as well. Um, consider your clients, latency, latency when you pick a region. Uh, that's very important. Yes, they see the ends uh, globally, but sometimes it still matters uh, depending on the product and the industry you are in. Uh, another tip, plan always for global rollout expansion. You might become the next unicorn today. Uh, and for that, you need to break on into new geographies, continents. So always plan, uh, even though you try to keep things simple, um, think about the future and that you might become a unicorn. I think every startup wants to become a unicorn. Then also um, tag all the things. I love tagging. I like grouping things. Um, I know the new Terraform providers even have tagging built in by default. So even if you don't explicitly tag a resource, it will automatically uh, add it for you. It's very useful for cost reporting. Um, so yeah, always tag all of it. Give it a business owner, give it an environment, give it a data life cycle. Uh, then also the KISS principle, which stands for keep it simple, stupid, for those that's familiar with it. Uh, basically, don't over-engineer. Uh, so like there is all these cool things like control tower and account factory. If you still a startup in the early phases, don't waste sort of time on those things. They can come later if you want to scale, be like a bank and you need to scale to 50 different uh, accounts or 100 different accounts in networks. So I would say don't over-engineer in the beginning. But again, it's depending on the requirements. Uh, separation of concerns. Uh, something I've learned over the years is to not couple networking, and that's IP networking, too tightly with the application. Keep that sort of separate. Um, and that is um, your VPCs or your VNets in Azure. Manage that from like a global holistic view where you keep proper routing in place. Because sooner or later, these things will need to start talking to each other. And if they on the same cedar blocks, there's always problems. Um, just some more tips and tricks around cost. Uh, always use multi-availability zones for high availability um, if your budget allows. Um, we are facing an issue where some stuff was hand-built on single availability zones. And today, they're in production. Um, and we need to change them. So it's just the effort to redo on a live uh, database. So yeah, just try to always go for production, multi-availability zone for any resources that needs it. Uh, parameterize your instance types and sizes and regions. It gives you flexibility for production and dev test resources. Production obviously need way more powerful compute than normally they test environments. So yeah, don't, don't hard code those. Then also watch out for third-party modules uh, that might over-provision. Uh, we recently discovered we were using a module from a uh, not an official provider from Ashicorp, and it was basically provisioning net instances um, in every subnet in all the regions we operate. And in those, we don't even use uh, private uh, subnets because our database is in a separate VPC. So we've just been paying for something we actually don't use. So just be conscious of like when you use third party modules, actually check what they provision. Uh, then also another tip, enforce Git repo policies. Always have reviewers review changes to production. 
Sometimes they're very small and uh, uh, something might snuck in that affects your whole platform. So always use a second and a third pair of eyes. Don't push to main uh, branch, basically. Then um, structuring by Terraform um, source code. So over the years, we've tried different things. And I mentioned it earlier. We group by servers, by product, even by cloud, by vendors. So I've tried a bunch of different things with teams and we over the years. And the more recently we decided we group by vendor and or business unit where it, where it makes sense. Um, and I'll also show a quick uh, structure uh, just after this. And then we use subfolders for different services. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is we keep also our state file separate for each of these folders or repos because it makes it faster. If your state file becomes too big, it's also there's sometimes credentials in these, so you want to be cautious about this. But if you run, have to run large plans and there's a lot of resources, it just takes time. So over time, this is what we currently do today, and it, it kind of works well for us. Before I jump to Q&A, I'm just going to uh, share uh, my Visual Studio code. So this is an example of how we manage our um, resources today. So we've got a networking. I mentioned that we separate that. And basically all this is cross account. And we manage VPC peering here. We manage root 53 here. Uh, we manage, uh, so everything that's cross account, this is very holistic globally how we do this. Um, we keep that separate from our other Amazon resources. Um, there's no on-prem here, so this is all Amazon Cloud Native. Then all our Datadog stuff, we keep separate with modules underneath. So we use Datadog for everything, log aggregation, APM, monitoring. Uh, all our dashboards is actually defined here as well. Our monitors is managed here. Um, so everything Datadog related, we keep here. Uh, and it's got its own workspaces. Terraform Cloud's got it, or networking, it's got its own uh, workspaces. Then Amazon, so we grew by vendor. So Datadog vendor, uh, Amazon vendor, we also group by Cloudflare at the bottom. I haven't added Confluent Cloud for now, just as example. But then we'll like under Amazon, we will have a separate folder for each resource type we use, like EKS, Amazon Message Queue. And each of these would have its own workspace, be it production or not. Uh, sometimes they have sub modules like RDS. We've got modules for MariaDB, MySQL. We even have uh, Aurora serverless now. Open search we manage differently. So all these resources we manage um, sort of on the individual level. EKS, uh, we've slightly changed to using Terraform Cloud private registry now. So we version our EKS modules we use across our clusters. Um, but this is how we structure today, and it works quite well. Um, also, we've standardized something I can show is our providers. So this um, looks identical across all the um, Terraform state we manage. So the, the tags we use, this is slightly evolved. I can take another one, for example. Um, we de basically standardized on this format. So everything that's related to Terraform configuration is in the Terraform.tf file. Um, and this looks very identical across all of them. So we don't, we keep a Terraform file, we have a locals, a data, but we've stopped using like providers because we configure to the Terraform cloud stuff here, as well as the different providers we use, um, et cetera. So yeah, just a view into how we do things today, which we find works well for us. And I'll give opportunity for one or two questions if they are, and we've got time. All right. Thank you very much, Connie, for sharing your experience. Not in bit experience, actually. Thanks for sharing that with us. And I see one question here. It says, um, based on your experience, of course, how does um, a new provider, you, you mentioned something about keeping provider updated. So this question from Christopher says, how does keeping provider updated affect existing code? You just want to touch on that quickly? Um, it, sometimes uh, it does. We, um, so 
normally it doesn't so it depends on what it is so my minor releases like going from version 1.3 to 1.4 was painless i've had problems before we're going from obviously 11 because i started i think pre version 0 0.11 to 12 to 13 there was quite a lot of changes in the providers oh sorry that's a terraform version not the providers the providers actually we had a recent incident where something changed on the EKS control plane, which broke something. So I would say always test and not in even a development or in a development platform environment. We also at a place now where we spin up a, a test cluster or sandbox cluster and even test the provider there before and which is a like for like to what our production and dev test environments look like just to make sure it actually works before we promote it to get an idea because we also had cases of where just a small change disrupt the whole like these things like the underneath the container d um docker changes that were into container d and so there's always so many dependencies so i would say test test before you promote but it's always good practice because if you don't do these small incremental changes then jumping from like 1.3 to 1.7 is even more major so it's very similar to local software development practices to try more frequent smaller updates versus these large big jumps awesome awesome thank you once again Connie. that was an exciting talk and we'll see you around please feel free to you know check the youtube stream i think there are more questions for you and you can just do justice to them over there. Thank you very much. Oh.